Welcome to the Expositors of Second Baptist Church of Houston North Campus. The class hosts the teaching ministry of James Brooks. Our mission is to grow in the knowledge of Christ through the expositional teaching of God's Word. We do this by studying the Bible line upon line and verse by verse. We teach sound doctrine as we look at and live out God's unfolding plan of redemption for His church. Now let's join James in this week's study of God's Holy Word. If you'll turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 6, we'll look at verses 14 through 24. Now we won't get all the way finished with that today because of time and the amount of uh, material that we have to cover, but uh, we'll try our best. <clears throat> when I was growing up, one of my uh, favorite uh, television shows was the Beverly Hillbillies. Anyone in here like that show? Okay, a few of you. I still watch it for some reason. Uh, uh, you know, the, the episodes in there, it's like uh, you take a group of people from somewhere in the south, uh, whether it be Tennessee or Arkansas or wherever they were supposed to be from. Uh, no, they're not from Mississippi, okay? <laughs> I'm from that state, so. Uh, and put them in uh, surroundings to where you have folk who were millionaires, when, when Jed and Granny and Jethro and Ellie Mae were living in that little log cabin, they were millionaires at the time. They just didn't know it. They were sitting on all that oil, and they just didn't know it. Now, the comedy of the show is based upon the fact that after they become millionaires, they move to Beverly Hills. And the comedy is found in the fact that even though they're now millionaires, they still look like dress like and act like hill folks. They don't live according to their position. And unfortunately in the church today we have many folk who are Christians who've been born of the Spirit of God, who have all the power and the resources of heaven, but choose instead to live according to their old position and not live according to their new position. And Paul addresses that for us today, beginning as we talk about the clothes that we're supposed to have as we engage in the Christian life. Um, you'll recall, uh, those of you who have been here and perhaps those of you who are visiting with us today, I know we have some visitors in here. Uh, let's uh, take just a quick uh, uh, stroll down memory lane as we've been covering the book of Ephesians. Uh, the book of Ephesians can be divided into two sections, uh, chapters 1 through 3 is our position in Christ. It deals with a lot of theology. It deals with what God has done for us and what God has done to us. And then in chapters 4 through 6, Paul transitions much like he does in his epistles and begins to talk about the very practical matters of the Christian life. In chapters 1, uh, he tells us that uh, how we were chosen... Uh, in Christ, how Christ redeemed us, and how the Holy Spirit sealed us. And so we, we have the triune acting of our God and Savior. And then in chapter 2, much like if you were to have a microscope and you look at an object under the microscope and you want to magnify it so that you can look at it even more closely, you'll turn that lens and all of a sudden now you're looking at something more specifically, something more intently. And that's exactly what Paul does in chapter 2 when he begins to tell us how individually we were dead in trespasses and sins and God made us together alive in Christ and seated us in the heavenly places. And then in chapter 3, Paul reveals the great mystery, something that was unknown in the past, but something now being revealed uh, that God is putting both Jew and Gentile in one body, and this body is called the church. And so after Paul delivers that real heavy theology on us, he switches over to chapter 4 to talk to us about how we should live in light of our position, that we should walk worthy of the calling by which we have been called. And then in chapter 5, he tells us that we are to walk in love. He tells us that we are to be mutually submitted to each other in the body of Christ. And then he gives very vivid examples of what that submission looks like in husband and wife relationships, in parent-child relationships, and then in employer-employee relationships. 
And then he wraps everything up here in chapter 6, which is where we find ourselves today and telling us to put on the full armor of God. Now in the verses that uh, we're going to be looking at, again, we're not going to get through all of the verses today. Uh, We'll get through some of them. But just to kind of give you an outline of what we'll be covering over the next couple of weeks, in verses 14 through 17, uh, we'll see that Paul tells the church that Christians are to have the right accessories. If you're going to go out to face battle, you need to have the right gear. You need to know what to put on. And then in verses 18 through 20, Paul will tell us that we need to have the right actions. That is, what are we to do? How are we to engage in spiritual warfare? In what realm are we to engage in spiritual warfare? And then in verses 21 through 24, how we are to have the right direction. Now, here in just a second, we're going to look at a couple of these verses, but it's important to remember that when we're talking about the armor of God, as Paul defines for us, uh, defines it for us here, there are six pieces of armor that Paul tells us. Six pieces of armor that we need to be mindful of. Now, these six pieces of armor are divided into two sections according to two main verbs that we find uh, in the verses between uh, verses 14 through 16. Paul tells us that we are to stand, that is, we are to be in a state of readiness. And then the second main verb we find beginning in verse 17 is that we are to take up, or the word in the Greek text from the root word dekomai, to him to take hold of or to receive. Okay, so what he says is that uh, in verse 14, the condition that we have to be in, present tense, is that we are to be buckled, are girded in truth. We see that in verse 14. Secondly, we need to have on the chest plate of righteousness. And then in verse 15, he tells us that we are to be prepared with the gospel of peace. And then in verse 16, he tells us that we are to have, that's a participle, having the shield of faith. And then he transitions there in verse 17 and tells us about pieces of armor that we need to take up momentarily. Now, a lot of people say, well, why does Paul write like that? Well, consider this. How many of you in here have ever seen a baseball game by show of hands? Everybody's hand should go up. Okay? In a baseball game, a player wears a uniform, much like I'm wearing a uniform today. This describes my state of being, much like a guy who's out on the baseball field The uniform identifies him as being in a state of being. Now, there are accessories that each of the ball players use. We know that baseball players use a bat. We know that they use a glove. But when a baseball player is out on the field, he doesn't have the glove with him the whole time. He only has the glove with him when he's playing offense, when he goes in, or defense. When he goes in to play offense, he doesn't use his glove. What does he use? He uses the bat. So he uses things that are necessary for the moment. And Paul is describing the same thing here. Our state of being, that is, that which is to be indicative of us at all times, is that we are to be buckled in truth, we are to have on the chest plate of righteousness, And we're to be prepared with the gospel of peace, maintaining the shield of faith. And then when we need it, and he'll tell us that we'll need it in the evil day, we'll need to take up the helmet of deliverance or salvation. That we are to take up the sword, which is the word of God. Actually, the word there in the Greek text is not the word for sword. A lot of times we like to think that uh, you think about movies like the 300 or Gladiator, you know, where they were having and carrying around that three-foot sword. No, the word in the Greek text for that's translated sword is actually like dagger. Um, we're to take the dagger, which was a much more um, useful weapon in close-quarter combat. And then finally, in verse 18, Paul tells us the, the realm in which these weapons are to operate and that is in a state of prayer and in a state of readiness or our alertness. So follow along with me as I read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 through 20. Paul says, 
Standing firm, therefore, having buckled or girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith which, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles or arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, with all prayer and all petition, and petition praying at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf. Paul then begins to get very uh, individualistic here. He says, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So let's pray. Our Father and our God, we pray that as we commit this time to you that the Spirit of God would remove our thoughts and the cares of this day and this life and allow us to concentrate upon you and your word not for the sake of head knowledge, Father, but for the sake of living it out as truth in life. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So let's begin by looking at the first couple of verses here. Paul tells us that believers in Christ need to have the right accessories in order to engage in spiritual warfare. Engage in spiritual warfare. He tells us that we need to have the belt of truth. Now, I know I have a picture up here of a fully fitted out Roman soldier, but if uh, we could uh, strip the armor from him and the shield away from him and the breastplate away from him and his helmet, we would find that under those clothes was just a basic tunic, just a robe. And over that tunic, one would place a belt. A Roman soldier would place a belt in order to keep the tunic from falling down and entangling him if he was going to be in battle. So what they would do is if they were going to go into battle is to pull up their tunic and tuck it into their belt so that he would be able to move his legs without uh, having them trapped up in his own clothing. And Paul tells us that we need to have on us the belt of truth girded about our midsection. We need to surround ourselves with truth. Now the word truth in the Greek text is the word aletheia. And what he's talking about is objective data. Truth is not what I say it is. Truth is not what you think it is. Truth is what God's Word says it is. That is truth. So it's objective data which corresponds to ultimate reality and doesn't change. Another writer said it this way, Truth is the sum total of the way things really are. As such, Christians are to surround themselves in truth. Consider some of these passages that we find from the New Testament and the Old Testament. In John 17, 17, in His high priestly prayer, Jesus, in, re in re making reference to God and uh, praying for the disciples, says, Sanctify them by your truth, or in the truth, your word is truth. Paul, in writing to Tim Timothy in his last will and testament, uh, said this, to young Timothy, he said, Do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. That is, rightly handling the written scriptures. In John 8, Jesus tells the disciple, And you will know the, know the truth, and the truth will set you free. In the Old Testament, in Psalm 19, the writer says, The law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. And then in Psalm 86, the writer says, Teach me your way, O Lord, as he is praying, that I may walk and live in your truth. Direct and unite my heart solely, reverently, to fear and honor your name. And then in John chapter 4, Jesus says, God is spirit. That is, God is an immaterial being, which means that you can't see God. Uh, it's not like he has physical uh, flesh and bones and, and eyes and ears and so forth. Uh, God is an immaterial being. God is spirit. And Jesus said, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That is, without pretense, in reality. 
And then in John 14, Jesus, speaking to the disciples, said, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So truth then is not some abstract concept. Truth is a person. Truth, Jesus Christ, is the truth. He is truth. No one, he says, comes to the Father except through me. So what do we understand about this truth that Paul wants us to wrap ourselves in? Truth is absolute. Truth is unchanging. Truth is unyielding. Even if we choose to ignore or reject truth, consider this. Again, this is the USS Montana requesting that you immediately divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. So, this is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over. This is the lighthouse, mate. It's your call. <laughs> So what can we learn from that? Well, we must orient ourselves to the truth. Why? Because the truth never changes course. We have to orient ourselves to truth and not the other way around, attempting to orient the truth to ourselves. So not only then do we need the belt of truth, Paul then tells us that we need the breastplate or chest plate of righteousness. Righteousness in the sense in which Paul is using it is a practical righteousness, not a positional righteousness. It is practical holiness rather than uh, positional holiness. Uh, for example, uh, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that He made Him, that is Christ, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf why? That we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So he's talking about a vicarious transaction going on here. That is, that when Jesus Christ was on the cross, God treated Him if, if He were me. Because He took the penalty of my sin and your sin if you're a believer here this morning. But that's not the only transaction. You see, God took His righteousness and credited it to my account so that even though I am a sinner, God declares me not guilty based upon Jesus Christ and His atoning work. In Romans 1.17, Paul writes, For in it, that is in the Gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. And then again in Romans 13, Paul says, The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly. That is, let us behave rightly in our experience. As in the day, not in carousing or drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh regarding its lust. In commenting on this passage, Tommy Ice, who is a, a director of the pre-trib study group, I had a chance to sit down with him a couple of years ago, a uh, real, real brilliant guy, uh, in reference to this passage says this. He says, although every believer is positionally righteous in Christ, he is also responsible to pursue holiness in his life by being obedient to Christ and having his character transformed and conformed to the character of Christ. This process takes place in a believer's life as he recognizes the sin in his life and then turns away from the sin to Christ. Very simplistic, is it not? What he's saying then is that he wants what we are in our everyday life and practice to be equal according to our position. And then he moves on to talk about the shoes of the gospel of peace. Let's look at that verse. He says, "...and having shod, that is, put on..." your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. 
What he's saying is that Christians need to stand ready. Or Christians need to stand in the surety of the gospel of peace. Now, one of the things that Paul is not talking about here, he's not talking about evangelism. He's not talking about that we need to put, uh, uh, you know, we need to be, go, be going out and actively engage in evangelism. Now, we need to be doing that, but that's not what he's laboring here. Uh, and a reason I think some people think that is because there's another verse over in the book of Romans uh, where Paul is talking about those individuals who do bring the gospel to people, and he writes, How will they preach unless they are sent, just as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news or the gospel of good things. But that's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about here is an encouragement, an encouragement of believers to stand firm in their position because of their proven belief in the gospel. Harold Honer, who has uh, got an excellent commentary on the book of Ephesians, I would highly recommend that you get it if you don't have it. It's a little costly, but it's very uh, well worth it. Uh, he does a, a lot of good exegesis in that commentary. Uh, but he says this in regards to this gospel and uh, gospel of peace. He says, The verse does not speak of the spreading of the gospel, for Christians are pictured in verses 10 through 16, is already standing in the gospel not advancing the gospel. Instead, this refers to a believer's stability or sure-footedness from the gospel which gives him peace so he can stand in the battle. So why can we stand in the battle? Why is it that when it seems like all hell is breaking loose in your life, you can stand firm in your belief? You can stand firm in your belief when you lose your job. You can stand firm in your faith when you lose a loved one. You can stand firm in your faith when your marriage seems to be going down the drain. On what basis does that surety come to us? It comes to us in this. It comes to us in knowing that first and foremost, as believers in Christ, we have been declared righteous in God's sight. Paul tells us in Romans 5, but God demonstrates His love toward us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. What is that telling us? No matter what happens in the here and now, nothing can affect my relationship in the sweet by and by. Moreover, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. Paul tells us in Romans 5, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, we can stand firm in the gospel, that good news of Jesus Christ that we are trusting in and that we hang the essence of who we are on is the fact that our peace with God lasts forever. The writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 7 talking about the intercessory work of the Lord Jesus Christ saying, Therefore He, that is He, Jesus, is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through Him. Why? Since He is always living to make intercession for them. So no matter what you do, no matter what state that you're in, even if you stumble into a state of sin, the Lord Jesus Christ is continually making intercession for you. Yes, sir. Right. We can have position in Christ because Christ mm -hmm. already won the victory. We're not to fight the battle. We're just to stand and fight Satan. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And every command that we find in the Old Testament, every act of faith, if you will, God never tells His saints, whether the New Testament or the Old Testament, uh, in regarding spiritual battles, that they're the ones who have to engage in it. Uh, and Jimmy's bringing up the point that many of our charismatic uh, friends today uh, take a differing view of this. Uh, I'll get into more of that next week, specifically when we talk about the Word of God, um, the Spirit, uh, the sword of the Spirit. Paul says the Word of God. He doesn't use the term logos there. He doesn't use the term graphe. He uses the term rhema. And whenever you mention rhema in, in today's church context, it brings with it a whole set of um, 
beliefs that are being advanced by our charismatic friends that have confused the issue and I think confused many in the church. So we'll, we'll deal a little bit of, with that next week. Did someone else have their hand raised? Okay. Um, in Romans chapter 5, Paul says, If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So in reference to this, MacArthur states, and I think he has a good note here, he says, if your feet are shod with the good news of peace, you are protected, and you will be able to stand your ground against the devil. You don't need to slip, slide, or fall when you're under attack. Since the gospel of peace is so effective in resisting Satan, let us make sure we understand what it refers to. And that's a good idea. When we talk about the gospel of peace, what is that? Well, the term peace in the Greek text is the word irene. And there are two types of peace that we see in Scripture. One is objective, and the other is subjective. When it comes to objective peace, this is based upon our position in Christ. We have peace with God because of what Christ did for us in reconciling us to the Father. Our subjective experience of peace deals with the peace of God based upon our obedience to Christ. If you're, not, if you're here this morning and you don't have a sense that you're right with God, you don't have a sense of peace in your heart, then you need to confess your sin and get restored in a sense of an experiential relationship with God. doesn't affect your position in Christ, but it has everything to do with experiencing the peace of God in your life on a day-by-day basis moment by moment basis. Our objective peace with God is judicial. That is, God declares us not guilty. As such, we have peace with God. Our subjective experience of God is experiential. Meaning, if I fall into sin, I'm not going to have a sense of fellowship with God. Our objective peace can only be experienced by believers. This week on the news and last week on the news, it seems like the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Everybody's looking for answers in all the wrong places. This world is looking for answers. This world is looking for peace, but it's a peace they will never be able to find because their peace is not grounded nor sought out and the only one who can bring peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. They look for peace in politicians. They look for peace in reform. They look for peace in all the wrong places. The only time that an unbeliever can have a sense of the experience of God's peace is when they come into contact with you. That's the only time an unbeliever can have an ex experiential sense of the peace of God. Not something that's inherent within them. Because they're dead in trespasses and sin, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2. And so the only way that they can have a sense in this life of God's peace is when they experience it and see it in your life and in my life. Jesus said in John chapter 14, Peace I leave with you. But then He says, Beloved, My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, because the world is like a tempest constantly going back and forth like the waves of the ocean, never providing something that's solid, never providing something that's continual. That's the world system of peace. That's not what Christ brings us. He gives us a peace that is enduring. He gives us a peace that's forever. He gives us a peace that calms and stills the soul. Therefore, He says, do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Paul goes on to add something similar to that in Philippians chapter 4 when he writes, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now the word there in the Greek text for guard is the word which means to stand ready with, with your weapon. Right now I'm 
in a uniform. And right now I have weapons around my waist. I have these weapons, but I'm not standing ready with these weapons. What would it mean to stand ready? I'm not going to pull my weapons out or anything. But just to let you know, if I were to pull my taser and to stand as if I was fixing to use it, I would be standing ready with a weapon. By show of hands, how many of you in here have ever been to the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier? Anyone? Okay, a few of you have. Let me ask you this. What's the one thing that you notice about the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier? Paul, you raised your hand. What, what, do you th what was the first thing that you noticed when you saw that? You saw the changing as they come out every so often. Now, what happens if you're standing there behind the rail? If you wanted to cross over to the rail, what would happen? They chase you back. What would happen if, if I want to get up there and, and start telling jokes in the stands? What would they do? It's very serious there. Those soldiers are there to guard the peace of that place. And they stand ready with their weapons at the ready. Consider this. Yeah, and if you forget to do that, this is what happens. If you notice them there, that's standing ready. There's a difference between walking the post and standing ready at the post. And what Paul is saying is that when we trust in God and we make our prayers and supplication to Him, we trust that the peace of God guards, that is to stand ready over our hearts, over the citadel of our life, to let nothing else come in. And then finally, in verse 16, he tells us about the shield of faith. Now, this is an interesting. Let's look at this verse. He says, In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you may be able to extinguish all the far, uh, fi fiery missiles, or that is, the fiery arrows of the evil one. So he's talking about a shield. A shield was used for protection. Now, there was a couple of different types of shields that soldiers would use. Uh, one type of shield was a relatively small shield, uh, like something, th those of you who remember watching the movie The 300, right? Something that they could go out and, I mean, it wouldn't cover their entire body. And then there was another type of shield, which the Romans used, which was approximately two and a half to three foot wide and about four feet tall. Uh, that type of shield was used, for example, in the movie Gladiator in the opening scenes when the Romans were finding the Germanic peoples how they would use those shields to cover all of the soldiers. You remember that? When they would shoot arrows or, or spears over into where the Romans were uh, staged, the Romans could easily protect themselves by raising their shields, those in front, and then those behind would cover both them and the person in front of them to uh, greatly minimize any type of arrow or spear coming through. That's what those shields were used for, protection. Now, Paul tells us that the Christian's faith is the shield. A Christian's faith is their shield. So, that begs the question, what is faith? A lot of times people, and I know there have been seminars written on this, I know there have been books written on this, what is faith? I mean, you turn on TBN and people talk about if you have great faith, and then you know you can blab it and grab it and name it and claim it. Is, is that what Paul is talking about when he talks about faith? No. What is faith? Well, the writer to the Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 when he says that faith, and that's the noun pistis, which simply means to believe in, to trust in, or rely upon. That faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Now, because of our English, sometimes we talk about hope. Um, I hope that when I go home, I have a good lunch. Meaning, maybe I will, 
but then again, maybe I won't. Right? There's always that a little bit of assurity, but with some doubt. Beloved, that is not the biblical term used for hope. Hope is confidence in God. Our confidence in God. Now, faith is the assurance of our confidence in God for the conviction that is the proof of things that are not yet seen. Kenneth Wiest, in explaining this verse, says that faith apprehends as a real fact what is not revealed to the senses. It rests on the fact, acts upon it, and is upheld by it in the face of all that seems to contradict it. Faith is real seeing. Now, what does that mean? Faith is real seeing. You know, faith it doesn't mean believing in something that you know ain't so. You know, a lot of times, and I've seen debates between Christians and atheists. Uh, at universities and so on. Uh, and I've heard an atheist say, well, we all know what faith is. Faith is believing in something that you know just isn't true. You would like for it to be true, but you know that it's really not true. That's not what faith is. Faith is very simple to define. How do I know that? Because if you want to know if you have faith, look at your feet. You see... Faith is a matter of what you do. It has nothing to do with how you feel. It has everything to do with what you're doing. If you go over, and we won't do it now for the sake of time, but if you go over today, here's your homework assignment. Read Hebrews chapter 11. Paul lists all of the great saints, or the writer lists all of the great saints. We don't know if it was Paul. A lot of people think it was Paul. They've got to watch that because I'm being taped and I don't want a lot of phone calls on it. <laughs> um, But the writer to the Hebrews tells us, and he mentions specifically Abraham, Moses, David, Samson. He mentions all of these great saints of the Old Testament. And he says that they had great faith. How does he know they had great faith? Because he says, by faith, Moses did this. By faith, Abraham did this. And he goes on and on and on. So if you, you want to know, do I have faith? Real simple to answer. Look at your feet. What are you doing? Real simple. Because faith is a reflection of your feet. What you believe. Yes, sir? I think in the King James it says substance, James, because mm-hmm. faith does have substance because of what it does. Faith is right. true through trials. If there's... Even though it's not seen, it's seen in your life. It is the substance of that faith, mm-hmm. the evidence that you believe, because you can go through trials that you can't believe you can even stand. Right. Right. And and biblically speaking, faith is always transitive, meaning there's always an object to the faith. Right. It's not faith in just like, you know, something hanging out in midair. It's faith in something, in this case, faith in someone. So you're exactly right. And the thing that we also need to know about this shield of faith is that strong faith in the Word blocks every form of fiery attack. Uh, The writer to the Hebrews says that without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that He is, meaning that He exists, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Now when I was growing up, There were reruns back then, but in the early part of the 1970s, the Roy Rogers show came on. Anybody in here remember that? Okay. None of the young people raised their hand like, Roy Rogers, who's that? I used to like to watch those old uh, westerns, The Long Ranger and Roy Rogers and so on. (laughs) And what's interesting about that is is there was a uh, and it actually happened in the old west but it, you see it in a lot of the old cowboy movies is that when you would have the settlers and the cowboys traveling from one place to another uh, very often uh, they would be attacked by Indians and when the wagon train was being attacked by Indians someone would always yell out circle the wagons circle the wagons why because it provides a defense Now the problem is, is that the Indians would start to attack the cowboys. And they would have bows and arrows. And the cowboys would have guns. Not a very fair fight. 
because you have these Indians shooting arrows and you have the cowboys shooting guns back at Indians when all of a sudden there would be one Indian who would get the idea that he would light the tip of his arrow with fire and shoot it over into the wagon train which was circled. Now, why would he light his arrow? Because an arrow that's not on fire will kill a cowboy easier and just as good as an arrow that is on fire. So why would he do it? Answer, to create a distraction for the cowboys. Why? Because the cowboys can't fight Indians in fires at the same time. Beloved, that's what Paul's saying here regarding the fiery darts or the arrows of Satan. They are meant to be to us a distraction. Don't get focused on the distraction. Stay focused on our objective because that shield can quench the fiery arrows of the evil one. Again, Tommy I says this, God's Word is sufficient to handle every temptation, every assault, every problem that Satan throws at us, not by launching an assault of rebuke or binding, which we're never instructed to do anywhere in Scripture, not by exorcism, but by standing firm and putting on the armor of God. By trusting God and obeying Him, we need not worry about any attack that Satan might use. Every trick that he tries can be handled by simply trusting the Word of God. Now, Tommy, that sounds really good. But give me something other than Tommy Ice's opinion. I mean, is there something in Scripture that gives me something to hang on? As good as that sounds, and as right as that might be, I, I need Bible. I can't be going with Tommy. So how does God then guarantee success in trials and temptations the way Tommy said He would? Well, the Apostle Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, I'll give you a second. You may want to turn over there. You can take a little note because a lot of confusion surrounds this uh, particular verse. But I think... Uh, if we go back and look at it just a little bit, we might be able to figure out and see how God always provides for us a way out when dealing with trials and temptations. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Paul writes this. No temptation... Now, let me ask you by a show of hands, does anyone's translation say anything other than temptation? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13... Mm -hmm. Right. The reason being is that temptation uh, is translated into English from the Greek word parosmos. And parosmos can mean trial or temptation. But level, we need to understand that there's a difference. God sends us trials, but God doesn't tempt us. Because James tells us that God doesn't tempt anyone, for God cannot tempt nor can He be tempted. And so we have to remember that temptation then is a solicitation to commit evil. That's different from a trial. God sends trials to us, that is, tests of faith. Why does He do that? God is omniscient. He knows where we are. He sends us the tests of faith so that we know where we are. Okay, so remember, temptation, though it's translated temptation, it can mean trial or temptation. And Paul says, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as common to man, meaning we all face them. We all face trials, we all face temptations. If you haven't faced a trial or temptation yesterday, then you're probably going to face one tomorrow. Because why? There it's common to man. He says, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you were able, but with the temptation, the word parosmos again, with the test or trial, He will provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. Now, it's interesting because a lot of times people like to think that God provides the, uh, the trap door. That you're in the midst of the battle and it's getting too hot for you. And so God provides the trap door. Anybody in here seen that movie Fury? About the tank, World War II? Remember in the, toward the end of the show, everybody in the... Well, I don't want to 
tell the whole movie. But in the movie, uh, the good guys are getting whipped. And they're surrounded by the Germans. And one of the fellows in the tank tells the other one, Hey, open up the door. You slip out through there. You can avoid everything. Just slip out through there. Now, is that what Paul means here? That God provides for us a trap door? No. Though if you just read it at face value, it appears that God provides for us the trap door. No. Let's go back and look at what he says. That for every temptation and test that we are faced with, that God will provide the exit path and most often, the exit path is enduring the trial to go through to the other side. Yes, ma'am. I hear this verse misquoted almost daily. Mm -hmm. God won't put anything on you more than you can bear. And they leave it sitting there. Mm -hmm. And I go, oh, yeah, you will. But read the rest of the verse. Mm -hmm. It's your choice to stay in the mess or to take the path you're giving you to escape. If you choose to stay in the mess, you can get messed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. A lot of times, because uh, it is a test, and we can be there by test, by God's design, or solicitation to commit evil, which is, it may start out as a test, but because of the heart motivation of the person enduring the test, they may have the wrong responses. Now it becomes a motive of obedience or sin, much like the children of Israel. If you ever look at a map between where the children of Israel were in relation to the promised land, they could have made that trip in a matter of days. It took them 40 years. 40 years. Why? Because every day God would give them a pop quiz. And guess what? They would fail it. He would give them a major exam from time to time. And guess what? They would fail it. All the while thinking they were doing what God wanted them to do. Walking around that mountain singing. Just a closer walk with thee. Not realizing that they weren't where God wanted them to be. Our responses, our attitudes in the trial, in many cases, determine how long that trial will last. But no matter the trial, God provides for us an exit path. He provides for us the way through the trial. Now, I know you've seen this, what I'm about to show you several times. I've added just a little bit to it, so uh, if you're looking at this and, oh, I know this chart already, good for you. <laughs> but there's two boxes on here, I think, that are kind of germane to the, the verse here that we're looking at. Um, every day, God is giving us, giving us trials or tests of faith. Every day. Again, he knows where we are because He's omniscient. The tests and trials of life determine for you so that you know where you are. And you will have one of two responses. You will have a biblical response, meaning you'll look at the test, you'll look at the trial, and you'll say, okay, God, I know this is by Your hand. This is by Your sovereign hand. I may not understand it, but I'm going to put faith in you and make the right biblical response. I'm going to go make peace with my neighbor rather than cursing my neighbor. And you make the right biblical response. Or you can say, I don't like my neighbor. That old nasty so-and-so, I'm going to cut down their roses. A fleshly response. Now the conflict with the neighbor... The conflict with the neighbor is the test. If you make the biblical response according to what Paul says here, then it's simply just a test. Parasmas is neutral. It's a testing from God. If you make the wrong biblical response for you, presenting you with that dilemma with the neighbor, now becomes a temptation because you've chosen to curse your neighbor and cut down their roses. At the end of our time, life, for those of us who are believing, we understand that life is a process of spiritual growth. 
We should all be growing. Test of faith that yield biblical responses also yield spiritual growth. These result in maturity and life. That is, experiencing God's life. The fleshly responses where we sin and curse our neighbor and cut down their roses results in immaturity, fleshly living, and experiential death. That is, separation from God and an angry neighbor. At the either one of two things are going to happen. You're going to physically die. That is, this God's going to call home your spirit. This physical body that is in uh, in houses or encases your spirit will cease to operate. Um, or Christ will return and rapture the church out of this world. At the judgment seat of Christ, for which all of us must stand, Paul tells us, we stand before Him at the bema or the judgment. Those things that are done for uh, in this life, those, that is, those things that we do in response to the tests of faith, where we make the biblical responses, will result in us and result for us rewards and inheritance. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Those things for us which are based upon fleshly responses, unbiblical responses, when we're confronted with the tests and trials of life, result in loss of rewards and loss of inheritance. And so we see a very strong motivation then revealed to us and for us to live a godly life and to make the right biblical responses. Because ultimately one day, you and I will stand before the Lord. That's a promise. Even Christ Himself said in Revelation 22, Behold, I am coming quickly and my payment is with me. The word there in the Greek text, mistos, and it means to get something by earning. Christ is going to return and justly compensate everyone. How do I know that? Because He tells us, to render to every man according to what He has done. Well, I hope that you have enjoyed this morning that you have a little greater insight into the armor of God. Um, the next two pieces that we look at next week, uh, we'll spend a little more time on, but they're parts of the armor that we're not to have on all the time. Uh, these, arm, these pieces of armor that Paul talked to us about today, this is part of our being. This is part of standing firm in who we are as believers in Christ. The next two pieces of armor are armor that we need to take up on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And when we come back, we'll see what those moments are when we need to take up the shield, or excuse me, the uh, helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Well, let's pray.